this time I would ask Dr. Ed Gross to come up. Uh, he is our guest preacher today. He's the uh, former pastor of Pilgrim Church in Roxborough. It's a PCA church there. I will let him uh, briefly explain what his current ministry is, and you'll obviously see a connection to that and what he'll be sharing with us from God's Word. Thanks. Well, it's wonderful to be back with you. It's been some 18 years since I've had the privilege of preaching uh, here, and that was uh, when we had a joint Reformation Day service uh, when I was joining Chip Stonehouse and planting a church up in Gwynedd Valley. And so it's been a long time. Uh, my kids were going to Philmont, and uh, they're all graduated and uh, graduated from college and now uh, Deb and I have uh, left our pastorate in Maniunk following a call of God to be uh, missionaries um, back and forth to Africa and here in the United States as well. Uh, my uh, mission statement uh, is to follow Christ and to make disciples of love who will advance his kingdom by multiplication and missional unity. That's what I live to do, and uh, we had the privilege, I and my brother Fred Hall, who's here, uh, to share with you earlier this year for about eight weeks in adult Sunday school, uh, a set series that we call Renewal, of biblical discipleship and we are doing that now all over the United States and abroad as we are reminding people uh, that disciple was the chosen name of Jesus to depict a believer but today Barna lets us know by his surveys that 90% of churchgoers prefer the name Christian. In fact, 2.3 billion people on the earth call themselves Christian. Even though the term is only used three times in the New Testament, was never spoken by Jesus, was originated in Acts chapter 11 by pagans who wanted to nickname the disciples of Jesus or caricature them. They called them Christians, as that text says. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. What we are trying to do, because this is what God has done with us, is to look back and experience the answer to prayer that all of us are praying when we pray for revival, renewal, or reformation. Those are all re-words. So what are we wanting to get back to? What do we, what was the new thing that we want renewed? What was the formative thing we want reformed? What was the original life that we want revived? It is. New Testament discipleship. That is what has occurred, is occurring around the world today and has occurred with every revival that has occurred. You see, the problem is this. When we come into a relationship with Jesus, we are normally brought into that relationship through someone who helps us. And the natural next step is go to church with me. This is what has happened to us who go to church. Many of us. It had happened to me for decades, even as a pastor in good reform circles. And that is this. Many of our denominations Many of our 
local churches are orbiting around Jesus, checking in on him occasionally as the orbit or the tradition or the denomination defines it. So we all slip into a more comfortable relationship with Jesus as we embrace the relationship as it is being sustained by those with whom we are worshiping for the most part. Well, there's always a few fanatics who we think press, you know, the borders a bit too far. We may pride ourselves in not being Pentecostal, but that also is an orbit. I preach and speak in many of their churches. The Presbytery has freed me up to make disciples and disciple makers wherever the door is open. So it is being opened all over and in all different orbits around Jesus. The fact is Jesus didn't say, come and connect with me occasionally. He said, follow me. Walk with me. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The amazing fact is that the disciples of the first century believed it and obeyed it as well they could. So today, what we are seeing is an increasing chasm between even evangelical Christianity and what first century discipleship was. Because we are defining our relationship to Jesus by our orbit that connects with him. Oh, you know, every morning we'll read our Bible, we'll have our personal devotions, we'll come to church, maybe prayer meeting or a small group. You say, we're doing so much better than others. That's just because perhaps our orbit is a bit tighter than theirs. This is not discipleship. As we'll see today, from the text that I have chosen, because it has been called the most difficult text on discipleship in the New Testament. Just before we read it, I want to read the words of one that historically many of us knew and would respect as he wrote on this subject, a book called Christ's Call to Discipleship. Dr. James Montgomery Boyce wrote these words in 1986. In the last 18 years, as pastor of Philadelphia's 10th Presbyterian Church, I have written 30 books, but I have not had apprehensions about how a book would be received until this one. I know that many will misunderstand it. They will suppose I am teaching that good works enter into a believer's justification, which of course is a false gospel. I am insisting, though, on the full scope of Jesus' teachings about what being his disciple means. I stress obedience, service, humility, taking up the cross, all major themes in Christ's teaching. But I know, because of the weaknesses and distortions of much of today's evangelical teaching, that many will see this as somehow being something new and dangerous, and they will reject it as an alien gospel. Only a few will take Christ's call to discipleship seriously and profit by this study. You know how careful a theologian uh, Dr. Boyce was. He said, there is a fatal defect in the life of Christ's church in the 20th century, a fatal defect. When something is fatal, if it isn't operated upon, it will kill that which it infects. There is a fatal defect in the life 
of Christ Church in the 20th century. This is nearly 30 years ago. A lack of true discipleship. Discipleship means forsaking everything to follow Christ. But for many of today's supposed Christians, perhaps the majority, 30 years ago, it is the case that while there is much talk about Christ and even much furious activity, there's actually very little following of Christ himself. And that means in some circles, there is very little genuine Christianity. Many who fervently call him Lord, Lord, are not his disciples. Well, as I began this trek, determined that I was not here on the mission field making disciples in the way that the apostles of Jesus made disciples, it took me through a long study, research, and repentance in order to understand what it meant and looked like to walk with Christ today. Everywhere I go and everything and everything I do. Our text this morning in Luke chapter 14 is one that Dr. Boyce speaks to a lot. So I would encourage you to get that book or many of the others that have been written on New Testament discipleship and begin your own study. My research in that one focused area alone has taken me to study over 15,000 pages of New Testament literature uh, written on this subject because I did not want to stand before a church and speak wrongly, to speak out of place, even though, as Dr. Boyce said, much of what is said will be hostily objected to. Why? Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. And that term was universally understood throughout the Near East in the first century. That term, largely speaking, has been lost in our day. Discipleship is not Christian education. Discipleship is not Sunday school. Discipleship is not sitting under preaching and hearing the Word of God preached. Those are all good. They all take their place as being important. Discipleship is something very different from all of that. It is walking with God and it is showing someone else how to walk with God and what that demands. That's why in the Great Commission it says teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now I know in the churches I pastored, obedience was a very unpopular term. I was recently told that one of the most generous Christian funders will not fund any ministry that stresses obedience. Because everyone is in this kind of reaction to works righteousness and legalism. So we want to make sure that we are on the right side of that issue and emphasize the grace of God. I would urge you to read concerning the grace of God, the work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his distinction between cheap and costly grace. Because the grace that Christ offers us is free, but it costs a person his life from the outset of the call. 
And that is the difference between how I evangelized for decades and the pressurized decisions that I called for compared to now the very careful evangelism that is issuing forth in the most fruitful time of our ministry by many times over in calling people to what this text today calls you to. Luke 14, 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of God. Our message today is uh, entitled Discipleship is not a buzzword. A buzzword is simply a word that has become very popular in one's culture and therefore is used quite often, at least for a while. I'm, I think of one, one condition. When you think of something that is very popular and think through your life of how something that is popular was termed, many different buzzwords come to your mind. In the late 50s, when I was first getting my social consciousness, something that was very popular was hip or neat. Developing on, it became cool or sweet. Then after a decade, it became righteous. And not long ago, it became wicked. It's amazing what buzzwords are. Something that's wicked is something that's popular. Something that's cool. Something that's sh shockingly uh, sweet. Discipleship is not a buzzword. It's Christ's defined word for the relationship that he sustains as our Messiah in saving us from our sins. Used 250 plus times in the Gospels and the book of Acts, it is, with, it is unmistakably clear. But the danger I had was that all those years that I was having my devotions, reading and preaching uh, through the Gospels and Acts, I'd read disciple, and I just said, that's me. That's the Christians I know. And just switch who we were for them without really looking at whether or not the text, if applied today, would embrace us. Which I'm convinced in many instances it would not. Because what we have developed over the years is this understanding. This is, this is particularly a reformed proclivity. That is to think that if we've studied it 
We've got it. If we've read it, we know it. That simply is not true. In the New Testament, what you don't do, you don't got. You do not have what you do not do. James made that clear. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James 1.22. So if discipleship isn't a buzzword, what is it? Well, in the text, it's very clear what it is. You have the outline in your bulletin. It's not a buzzword, it's a dividing relationship. Relationship with Jesus. It's a painful relationship with Jesus. And it's an exclusive relationship with Jesus. That is what discipleship was and has been. And I noticed and would encourage you if you did not read the fine print of your enclosure that at the very bottom it says free book. Get a copy of Miraculous Movements by Jerry Trousdale. Completely free. You say, why in the world would I want a copy of something that talks about miracles, number one, and movements of miracles, number two. Because this is what God is doing all over the globe. I work with Jerry. Jerry said, Ed, we know how to make disciples, but we don't know how to take Christians from their Christianity into discipleship. Write that book. And so I did. It's called, Are You a Christian or a Disciple? Renewing and Rediscovering New Testament Discipleship. All over the world, the most common Christ followers are doing the most extraordinary things. You say, prove it. I say, read the book. You say, that doesn't prove anything. Wrong. Thomas Nelson Publisher said to Jerry, though he had worked at Thomas Nelson, we cannot publish your book because its claims are too grandiose unless we send our own independent investigators into Africa to examine every one of these cases, which they did. And they published the book. I studied very carefully the protocols of examination that those investigators took because I have my own history with debate and publishing on the theme of miracles and the importance, as Warfield himself uh, told us, miracles are events wrought by God in the physical world. If they are such, they are observable and can be proven to be so. Well, the propensity is to deny them all and to poo-poo them all, but I can tell you, Hundreds of thousands of Muslims. Just with this group, city team, 400,000 Muslims in the last nine years are becoming Christ followers. 20% of their leaders are converted Imams. Story after story of Mujahideen, of radical terrorists being slain by the love of Christ as they have seen born-again Muslim disciples coming back. To share the good news with them. Now, we can be comfortable in Willow Grove and deny that that is happening. But it is happening. And we are praying, dear God, bring it to greater Philadelphia. 
is for that which many of us are praying and working. Why? Because what we see here in Luke 14 is not the exception, but the rule. There's nowhere in the evangelism of Jesus that he gave a kind of invitation for a catch-all prayer with every head bowed and every eye closed that would then bring you into this glorious justification out of which all your worries about Satan on earth and hell after are solved. You look without success for such evangelism. As I was raised in and taught and trained now we're seeing more people come to Christ than we've ever seen before. I have Muslims walking up to me now. When I go into a Dunkin' Donuts. Not because I've stuffed a track down their pockets and some people are saved through gospel tracks, praise the Lord. But a pressurized evangelism is not the kind of evangelism that we see in the New Testament or that Jesus trained his disciples to do when he sent them out as people of peace to find men and women of peace. He told them what they look like. He told them what they sound like. He told them what they will do. City Team alone in its nine year uh, launch into Africa found, listen to this, 18,000 prepared Muslims of peace that they didn't have to debate for a year as to whether or not Jesus was the Son of God. They were readied by God. And disciples went, as Jesus said, and found them ready, as we are doing. Now, the good news is this is really happening. The great news is your pastors have been trained in this. The bad news is they're going to be emphasizing this to you, disturbing your orbit, telling you, walk with Jesus. When Jesus is near, everything, everything is easy. When Jesus is distant, everything is hard. Discipleship, I think succinctly stated, is simply this. Don't let anyone or anything ever come between you and Jesus. Pray without ceasing. Discipleship gives birth to those kinds of people. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is the norm of those who walk with Christ. These are difficult words. A relationship that divides like this in Matthew and Luke 14. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So today we have the option. I won't be that disciple. I'll be a Christian. Which, by the way, you know, I'm a good Presbyterian and I'm a studied Presbyterian. I'll say this to the elders present. Research in Presbyterian history, what a credible profession of faith was defined as. And you will be amazed to find that about a hundred years ago, the life of discipleship was excluded from a credible profession of faith.
I was saved. My parents were 40 years old. We were from a mainline background. Our minister disavowed the word of God. My parents were born again. We were filled with love for Jesus and wanted to reach our culture for Jesus. I began preaching. I remember one of my first sermons was Luke 16. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? However, I was not taught by my mentors that I had only spoken the last couple of sentences in a very important context that begins. If any man will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever saves his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me in the gospel will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I chose to omit that which my teachers chose to omit because very few people would choose to respond. When you put before them the kind of evangelism that Jesus and the disciples did. And we wanted to save more than that. In the book, I go into the whole history of how the term was lost and the different pushbacks against it from all the different backgrounds. But what is important is your heart today. In following Jesus, where does he abide? So close to you that he can take from you precious relationships. If they demand that you leave him. It's a dividing relationship that we have. Listen to just a couple quotes from the martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer. By calling us, come, follow me. By calling us, and by the way, that call, follow me, is the bookmark in the Gospels of the normal Christian life. It was the first words, Mark 1, that Jesus spoke to his disciples, and it was the last words, John 21, that he spoke to Peter. When Jesus is about to ascend, and Peter says, okay, you've, you've shown me how I'm going to die, now what about him? Speaking of John himself. And Jesus says, well, if, it, if I want him to stay alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. Well, how can you follow someone who's invisible? Read the book of Acts. Because we are they, and they are us. We are waiting for the second coming. We are not in some different epic than they. By calling us, Bonhoeffer says, he's cut us from the things of the world. He wants, Jesus wants to be the center. Through him <clears throat> alone, all things shall come to pass. Jesus stands between us and God and between us and all other men, women, children, and things. He is the mediator, not only between God and man, but between man and man. Between man and reality. Now we learn that in the most intimate relations of life, in our kinship with father and mother, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> in married love, in our duty to our community, direct relationships are impossible for the disciple. Since the coming of Christ, his followers have no more direct realities of their own between father and son, husband and wife, the individual and the nation stands 
Christ, the risen mediator, whether they are able to recognize him or not. To deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial says is this. Jesus leads the way. Keep close to him. It's a dividing relationship. It's a painful relationship. Verse 27. Anyone who does not carry his cross, the emblem of torture, of shame, of exposure, of abandonment, anyone who does not carry his cross cannot be my disciple. If you want a shot and, and a good read of what an Orthodox Jew thinks of these statements of Jesus, read Jacob Neusner's book, A Rabbi Talks with Jesus. Because he gets it. He knows the devotion that disciples pay their rabbis. He himself is one. And he looks around at Christianity and he sees something far different from what he studies in the New Testament. It's a painful relationship. We were just talking about it this morning. We are too thin-skinned as Christians. This is one of the reasons why we really don't like intimate small groups. Frankly, here's Joe, young Christian, spilling the beans on his struggles this week. And here am I, orbitized, respectable, long-time Christian, and I dare not spill the beans. Because what will people in the orbit think if I spill the beans? Well, this, of course, the gospel you have preached to you every week is about spilling the beans because Christ lived the life we could not live and died the death we deserve. So it's all about Jesus. But we've got to help each other realistically down this very still. Now here's, here's the problem, and again, I'm, I'm quoting many different authors who said this in many different ways. Everyone used to think that the way was narrow, hard, and the gate was small. Because wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go in thereat. But unfortunately, we've developed a Christianity that offers us a third way. It's not quite so narrow as that, and it isn't as broad as that. But you know, you can really have your feet in both worlds and deny the commands of Jesus. You say, not all of them, not all of them. Of course, not all of them. Just the ones you want to deny. And still be an acceptable Christian. The day is coming. It's, it's called the day of the Lord. When no other reality is going to matter to anyone. And we're going to see that Jesus meant what he said. And his call is to walk by faith, not by sight, to follow me, to let nothing ever between you and me 
and I will be with you always to the end of the age. He gave that promise to disciple-making disciples. And you as a congregation stand at the crossroads of a huge decision. And I pray that you will follow Christ. It will mean you have to say no to many things and repent of many things. This is what my study has drawn me to conclude. And it is not. I could, I could prove it, but of course, I've gone over time already. It's not impossible to prove that today's evangelical churches are far farther from God than the first century synagogues were. What did John the Baptist do? He came preaching repentance. Repentance to an observant Jew who numbered 603 commandments and carefully lived his life so that it was absolutely safe to be around him? Yes. Repent. Well, repentance is needed to be preached again to us. The acts needs to be put to the root in our lives in whatever way that we are convinced by the Holy Spirit working through Holy Scripture that we are not following Jesus because the day is coming and the man that I work with as my as the executive director Mark Saraceno just lost his wife to cancer and said Ed it's over. Our life together is done. And that reality, which he shared with me this last week, so has settled on him that he has said, really, Ed, nothing else matters but following Jesus. Verse 33 is said to be the hardest verse in the whole New Testament on discipleship. It is the verse that shows that surely discipleship is not a buzzword. It's an exclusive relationship with Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. It is an exclusive relationship with Jesus. And so he said... In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Today, while we're sitting here, there are hundreds of thousands and millions of new disciples who don't know what you know, who have never been taught what you've been taught, who have not read their Bible through because many of them are illiterate. And all they know to do is to repeat the stories that they hear, memorize the biblical stories, pass them on, and somehow the Holy Spirit's all over that, bringing hundreds of thousands of Muslims to faith in Jesus Christ. But we are here, and God is in both places and everywhere. And so are his promises and his Holy Spirit. What will you do with Jesus' call to follow me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the light of your word. And light does expose darkness. And sometimes we like darkness. We do like to sleep sometimes oversleep. Dear Jesus, speak again to our hearts. You said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I know them, and I give unto them eternal life, and they will never perish, 
and no one will pluck them out of my hand. May there be in every Christian in this congregation a renewal of biblical discipleship that they may come alongside of you, Jesus, and take up that yoke and follow you with joy, filled with love, and a life of fruitfulness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.